Hello everyone, this video will be the third about textures and materials and the last one before the DVD for Project Mango ships. So it's not the last one you will find on my YouTube channel and I will probably do more on the assets for Project Mango and more in general. And the main topic of this tutorial is complete materials. We have here one for the Gribble Kit that shows about all the typical features of the materials I've used for the dome and then we'll see some from the actual dome file. I want to show you the standard configuration in the node tree space of these materials so you can take apart the materials and it's going to be probably uh, messy and difficult to understand uh, what the material does. It always is with node trees. Reading your own node trees sometimes is difficult, reading someone else's node trees is a pain and I tried to do all I could to organize them and make them consistent and reduce the number of nodes. Maybe when doing compositing for the layers for the render a hundred nodes is well probably the minimum and you need all those nodes. With materials you have maybe hundreds so each one has to be definitely smaller and something between 10 nodes and 50 nodes for each material is already quite difficult then to navigate. So what's good is that you have node groups so all the visual clutter that will distract and confuse you if you can hide it into a node group well that's really good. So let's start with the normal organization of material at least the ones I did in the dome you have at the end a shader preset and the output in between the blending operation and then the source textures. This is the kind of division that I talked about in the earlier tutorials but in space you have them textures and inputs on the left blending in the middle and then the output on the right. I also tried to keep masks above and color texture color or uh, glossy I mean actual textures below in this area so you have like the dirt map here in the corner very often the color or vertex color ambient occlusion in alternative to the dirt map somewhere around here if you have other kinds of masks like bitmap masks or uh, vertex color masks they generally are in the top here and then generally the color textures and uh, this scratches and grunge maps like this one for the scratches well they are something in between uh, an actual color texture and a mask paint patches or the scratches which are also included with the texture library from project mango and uh, we're actually done scanning scratches I did on a piece of metal with a coin and then put as a particle system of all these textured planes to get the right density and the right randomness and then edit it in GIMP to get various layers and so you have these grunge textures that are in between a color map and a mask what I call masks are generally object based stuff what I put generally on top like a vertex color that would divide an object that is made of stone and brick to divide the two materials I would put a vertex color um, black and white mask and I would place it generally on top and now let's see what's actually going on inside this material let's start from this texture which is the gray metal and it's the base for the material in fact it goes into the gray for this two blocks which are the diffuse and also the bump it's been recycled this one is that is the glossy the gray is the flat main area of the texture the black receives the rust texture for the diffuse and just black color for the glossy the white areas receive just a dark 
grayish color for the diffuse and white for the glossy but they get their shape and their texture from the scratches texture the one we've seen before and so we have two main blocks that create the two main channels then we have the diffuse going to the bump texture uh, it's you can just generally uh, reuse your diffuse as bump and expect it to work all the time but in this case we have a black color that is more or less recessed a gray color that is average and a white color that is darker and what we want in the bump is the scratches to be a bit lower than the main areas so gray darker gray it's good enough to do the bump without making a new stencil block which would be better definitely because also the black the rust could be sticking out a bit compared to the base level but there's enough stuff going on for this material considering it's for backgrounds and so it's good enough to just recycle for the bump but sometimes it can be the diffuse recycled as bump it could be the glossy depending on the grayscale level of the various texture if they fit the bump they could be inverted or you could use any other of the channels if they fit the bump you want to obtain or if it's really important to get the bump make a new blending or a new texture then we can see that this diffuse box then we can see that this diffuse box passes through an overlay before going to the diffuse color and this overlay gets the color from the vertex color channel let's switch to blender internal to see it better yeah and this way we can see the dirt map and the vertex color so it's just an overlay at 95 percent with the original texture let's see it. so this is the original texture and you can see one of the typical situation with doing textured materials this way that most of the blending modes available darken too much and that's a fairly important question so that it forces you to keep things brighter everywhere you can because then you get a pretty good blending between the metal color and the paint color the base paint color by doing an overlay but it darkens it quite a bit so fortunately in this case it worked well to have this fairly bright and then by adding the overlay you get the bright brightness for this material i often blend the overlay of flat colors something between 0.7 and 0.95 never 100 percent i sometimes use multiply which is the mode that darkens the most overlay darkens less oh. and then soft light is the one that darkens the least but also has sometimes not enough effect on the colors so i would generally go through these three modes and see which one would work better sometimes it's also one of the limits of trying to blend texture this way it's a bit of a hack to use overlay and it works but sometimes it's the root of many problems there are some kinds of material like for building facades maybe overlaying too much for bricks and plaster and wall paint overlaying too much can get quite messy results so you'd rather go by mixing with a normal mix or use masks textures 
uh, with an alpha channel or other ways to blend by different amounts in different areas. Okay, then not much more to say about the glossy. We've seen the levels and what they mean. Uh, we can just notice that the noise amount for the diffuse is generally lower than the noise amount for the glossy, so we have some scratches in the diffuse channel too. The scratches affect the diffuse channel too, because where the paint is peeled away, you have a base darker diffuse. Okay. And this also works so that in areas where you don't get glossy highlights or in cases in lighting conditions where you don't have glossy highlights, you get a different effect. You don't get this bright highlights, but you might have the material under a different light looking more like this. But still, as I said, the diffuse is a bit more uniform and instead the glossy has a bit more noise. So there are some scratches that create the highlight even if the diffuse color below of the paint is not taken away completely. And that also works there. Then many other ways to make different materials. Sometimes uh, you could say that uh, paint on metal chips sharper. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to have this wear out and thinning effect. Sometimes you might want to have a stronger, more defined areas that chip away, not just a flat gradient. Then you might have a primer area between them, but I generally prefer to get away with a simple three levels without the primer, at least for background objects. And the last box you see here is something that is not there for all materials. It controls the roughness. Sometimes getting the correct roughness in the correct areas is uh, even more important than getting the right amount of glossy. So. Sometimes the roughness is more important than the intensity. And you can see I've unplugged everything with a flat color for Grossi and the differences in roughness really help to get the look and the character of the material. Then, as I said, many materials in the dome don't have a control for roughness. They have a roughness of like 0.2, 0.4 all over and that just to keep things simple and keep materials simple and a bit faster with less chances of noise but if you want to refine your material spending some time on getting the right roughness effect the right amount in the right places it can really make a big difference in this case you can see it's the this metal patches used uniformly without any influence from the dirt map because well the dirt map is doing enough with the glossy intensity but it would make sense too to have like the dirt map connected as a factor then a mixed color with your texture as a factor is a quick way to remap it and like say i want to use this black and white image but i want to use it inverted and with less contrast and i just put two a light gray in the color one and a dark gray in the color two i check the numbers if i want to connect it to the roughness i check the numbers so i know exactly what roughness i'm using 0.3 and 0.07 for a very shiny and this makes sense too 
The dirt map used for controlling roughness makes sense used this way with shinier, more mirror-like edges and rougher, more diffuse central and recessed areas. And here's an example of a material from the actual DOM library file. It's not a typical material, but rather an ugly and nasty situation where I had this base mesh. It was good to have a single continuous base mesh, even if then on top of that all the details had to be added with three materials in one. And I wondered for a bit if that made any sense, if it wasn't going to be too messy and too complicated, uh, which of course is. This size of a node 3 for material is already getting a bit difficult to navigate, even if you can sort of see that there are three lines and these three lines are the three materials. But in the end, I think it worked, meaning that with an engine without nodes, like Blender internal, you would have had to make three separate materials, probably, or one big texture, or a lot of stencils that would have gotten uh, not only complicated, but not really practical. And you can see that you have a mask, number one, that is, you can see there's a mask, number one, that divides the dirt road surface from the bricks and then mask number two that is for the stones around the arches they are a bit blurry because it's a vertex based mask but that's actually a good thing it helps the materials to blend into each other a bit So you can see I have the mask on top and the second mask also on top. A texture, a tileable texture to add variation to the mask. I could plug this directly into the diffuse so we can see this is the mask one to divide road surface and bricks. And then we have mask two for the stone blocks. And all these masks go each one into the different channels. So you have the mask going to this line of boxes for the diffuse, the two masks going into this line of boxes for the glossy, and then one line for the bump. Then you have the Dutch brick block, and it's a block of textures. Probably what saved this material from being really too complicated, and in general, one thing that really helps to keep these nodes materials relatively simple is to try and put the mapping nodes, the UV coordinates, the coordinates nodes, into a box so you don't see them every time cluttering all your space. Then we, so we have the bricks, then the single texture for the blocks, they had to be mapped on an arch, so UVs in here. Everything else is blended box mapping. And then the texture for the ground, and you can see it has two layers. It's not for refining the aspect, it's for getting the right resolution and to cover tiling. So you have one with tiling 0.3 and one tiling much smaller, well actually much bigger. And this ensures that if you see it from this distance, it makes sense. If you see it from this distance, or well, still you don't see too much of an apparent tiling. And then everything else is a rather standard material, except it's making three materials in one, with a standard diffuse, the various 
channels. And then one box that is not mine, this is Andy's, I think, and it's a rather interesting trick using camera array to replace all this relatively rather heavy uh, mess of textures and colors with a nice flat gray for everything that is not the camera. And in fact, you don't need to have all this complexity for the GI or for any other situation that is not the camera. Well, maybe for the fractions, if you were rendering uh, with some chrome materials in it, but for then doing the camera mapping, this probably was something required and that was very useful to get things rendering much faster. And one more material. This one is a fairly typical one, but with one interesting thing in it. So it's typical material because you have the standard diffuse plus glossy, two boxes of stencil, one for the diffuse and one for the glossy channel. And then a bit less than the gribble kit material we've seen. Just the metal grunge texture that has been used so many times. The scratches also. Then not a dirt map, but a vertex color ambient occlusion channel and a color channel. The color channel is the one for this base metal paint colors. The vertex color ambient occlusion is way less refined and less reliable than dirt maps unless you have a very dense geometry. But wherever I could get away with vertex color, which consumes less memory, I tried. And let's see it. The vertex color ambient occlusion probably add a few bevel and edges just to get a better vertex color, but it was working for this kind of mesh. And then the color itself is a bit blurred. I generally would start by selecting some faces and in vertex paint mode, shift K, assign some color, select more faces, assign another color, or very sharp, very simple, and that's basically what you see here. But then one level of refinement would be to, with a not too opaque brush, go and paint some subtle variations. You can still add a bit of detail in the vertex color, but you have to keep in mind that unless the mesh is very dense, it's going to be very blurred, but it's fine because one thing you need in textures to get a good material is different scales, different frequencies of details. So the low frequency, the big shapes is what you can get from a vertex color. Big blurry colors, just as you need to have some high frequency details, small, sharp, precise details like the scratches. They are all ingredients for a nice looking material. So it's like vertex color does the low frequency, big shapes. The dirt map will do the medium details and the, the scratches or the photo textures will do the fine detailing. Then it also needs to make sense as a material. So I have rust or the right kind of scratches or the right kind of bricks, but as a general rule, thinking also in terms of having enough things going on for every kind of scale of detail also helps. And the color again is used as the base, base paint color. In this case, you can see the color going to the gray and then the photo texture being overlaid on top. Uh, it's more or less the same on each material. I would decide, try and see what was working best to put the color in the gray and then overlay the vertex color or vice versa. So you can see there's bright contrast node here and it's before the end of the diffuse channel. 
And this is something that Andy and the other lighting artists decided to put in basically almost all the materials I've done for the dome because at the first actual lighting test the common problem was that the materials were too dark and also sometimes too contrasted and they had to be washed down by brightening them so they could respond more to light. Because it makes sense that a modeler and texture artist caring more about uh, showing the textures and showing the volumes and the shapes. But if there's too much of the shape, like the ambient occlusion and the color already showing too strong, then the material won't respond that much to light. Things won't shade enough. And that's something I had not figured out myself, but then when I tried it myself later with Cycles, it made sense. In fact, there's a general rule, a general thing called equalization of textures where you have to avoid putting too much white and too much black or too much contrast in your textures. Then how much you reduce the range of your textures, it can be even too much. So it's probably also a good technical way to handle it this way. You have your image stored with your texture that has a a good range, not too much, not over, over contrasted or oversaturated, but the full range of the 8-bit image. And then just before passing it to the shading nodes, you reduce that range a bit so you get enough of the light affecting the material and the object. So that's it. That's all for this video. And for these videos before the DVDs are closed and shipped, I haven't done that much about the thing I did the most on Project Mang, which is modeling, uh, because it's somewhat harder to do world truths about modeling, better to, as people do, uh, do the tutorial while you're building something and show all the steps. But I also like cycles and textures. And for that, before saying more about it, I have to look around the forums. There, there's people around doing some crazy, interesting things. Uh, with the notes in cycle. So I hope to open some discussions and also check what everyone is doing in the Blender community, which is always such a great source of inspiration and knowledge and learning. So I hope you enjoyed these videos. Thank you for watching.